This is session D of the Advantage Player Training Course. What if you're restricted? Restrictions, really commonplace, both actually in Advantage Play sort of professional bettors and recreational customers these days, 2023, getting caught up in the restriction minefield. And many people experience restrictions and that's the end of the game for them. But does it have to be? Well, let's talk about them. I've got four videos in this training course. First of all, this is video one, restrictions, why they happen. Two, three, and four, we're going to look at soft bookmakers, betting shops, and betting exchanges. So video one, restrictions, why do they happen? So what are restrictions? A betting restriction is, you know, an outcome where a punter asks for a bet to be taken at a particular stake at particular odds and the bookmaker rejects this request. Now, the bookmaker may reject the bet in entirety or they may reject it partially through either a reduced stake or reduced odds or a combination of both. In 2018, Richard Flint, the CEO of Skybet, claimed that around 3% of his Skybet customers faced restrictions. 3%? Really? I mean, how they come up with that figure is clouded in secrecy. However, it appears on face value to be woefully underreporting, coming from a background of value betters and advantage players. Look, it's difficult for me to assess the relevant sample size, but in 2023, we have reached a stage where even recreational punters are experiencing restrictions. The elephant in the room isn't so much perched on the kitchen table, but desperately begging for peanuts. Let's look at different types of restrictions. They come in many different forms. The overwhelming source of restrictions, they come from computer code or algorithm, not from an actual person. So it's important not to take them personally, right? I mean, advantage play is a game. And if you lose the play and you lose the fun, then, you know, you get to a point where there isn't much impetus to continue. So the first type of restrictions is the Access lower denied. odds knockback. This is relatively rare as it's seen as poor form on the side of the bookmaker to accept the request of a bet from a shop customer and use this information, reject the bet and move the line. Here we see an example. We've rejected your bet of £100 at 10 to 1 because you're shop. So we're just going to adjust the odds to 6 to 1 and offer you £100 there. Now, this does happen. It's not common. And the punter can rightfully feel aggrieved and hard done by when on the receiving end of this kind of behavior because bookmakers that reside over such practices are known in parlance within the industry as scum, subhuman scum. You get the idea. This is because in the golden days, the olden days, it was gentlemanly practice to use sharp accounts as marks as a means to shape lines and manage liability. So a sharp customer comes along, wants a little bit of a price, you give it to him and then you adjust the line. So adjusting it before, adjusting the odds before you take the bet is poor form. Um, Pinnacle is an example of a success story where this kind of strategy hasn't been used. And instead they accept winning customers and shape their lines based on the sharps betting on them. Now the next form of restriction is a kind of still life knockback here. So we reject the bet of £100 at 10 to 1. You can have £99.50 at 10 to 1 instead. I mean, you know, you want a lucky 15 for £5 each way, and the manager tells you the max they can take is £4 each way. Knockbacks like this are often due to erroneous and weird logic from the systems that are trying to manage liability. A rule's been put in place that the maximum amount of liability left at 10 to 1 is £985, and therefore your £100 at 10 to 1 got knocked back. Now, don't worry too much about these knockbacks. They could be the first signs of further restrictions, or it could just be liability management, right? I mean, if it's the latter, whilst the re-offer may seem supercilious and a waste of everyone's time, a line has to be drawn somewhere, and often you can continue to bet for years on these accounts. However, occasionally they do lead to the heavily restricted account. The heavily restricted account has had its card marked for sure. A request from a bet may be confronted by one of several responses. I mean, we could only take a small fraction of that stake or less than a quarter, or you can bet, but you will not receive any concession, like best odds guaranteed or a free bet, or quite commonly you can bet the stake, but at SP odds only. That's 
starting price odds only, which counts in horse racing and greyhound racing. Now, these messages are often mixed. The stake may be so low, it's realistically worthless to you. If you wanted £100 at 10 to 1 and you're offered £10 at 10 to 1, then it can be superficially annoying. I mean, similarly, when bookmakers say you are banned from best odds guarantee, they may really mean... We think you're taking too many concessions. If you're banned to SP, starting price, the suggestion may be you're beating the closing line. However, it is common to be SP'd even when you don't bet on racing. I mean, the only sport where SP odds do apply is horse and greyhound racing. And I know of a golf better who picked a winner and as he was collecting the cash, he was told that he was SP'd. Okay, so what? You can't SP on golf. I mean, the next golfer we're betting on He's still going to be collecting the price at the time that he places the bet. So the message is really mixed. And what the bookmaker really means is your card is marked. That's the bigger picture. The final form of restriction is account closure or a trespass ban if we're using shops. I mean, this is a fairly rare form of closure. It's usually reserved for those suspected of fraud, violence, or the worst of all crimes, arbitrage. The game is up with this kind of restriction. At least it is in your name at this particular bookmaker. As we will come to later in this section, we always have options. So let's look at the second part of this video. Why restrictions happen? I want to split that into two different parts. First of all, I want to have a look at best business practice, and then I want to look at profiling. So why restrictions happen, why they happen in terms of business and why they happen in terms of what you've done to make them happen. So why do bookmakers choose to restrict as a component of standard business operation? Well, put yourself into their shoes. You operate James Doe Bookmakers Limited, a little independent family-run operation. Here we are, bet now, in the shop. For the last decade, you've had 100 customers per year, 99 lose, but each year the same one customer with this wheelbarrow for him to wheel down the road when the objective of your business is to maximize profits. Now, let's now imagine you're not a local family-run bookmaker, but instead a multinational FTSE 500 limited company with shareholders. This concept becomes even more pronounced in this situation. There are two primary forces to deal with here both of which are related. Firstly, limited companies have a legal responsibility to protect the interest of their shareholders. It would not be practical for the average shareholder to be involved in the day-to-day -day operations of a company. And therefore, this responsibility relies on the company's employees, executives, and board of directors to keep an eye on what's going on. This concept has risen to a culture of search, identify, and restrict amongst all staff from front of shop through to the graduates training scheme and up through senior management. Managers' reimbursement can be related to profit, which in turn is related to the maximization of losers and the minimization of winners through that strategy of search, identify and restrict the winners. It could certainly be argued that this strategy has swung way too far, that the balance isn't right and that recreational losers have been caught in the crossfire. As winners it would be a straw man argument to go down this route. We should be restricted and we do get restricted. The game for us to play is to avoid and circumnavigate these restrictions using all of the legal tools at our disposal. Before we look at those tools, let's take the second part of this segment, why restrictions happen. Let's look at the actions that we take as betters that lead to restrictions. So firstly, we take any bet where the back price is higher than the lay price on the exchange. This is the typical profile of an arbitrage player, someone who will bet all sides of an event for risk-free profit. This always begs the question, if the bookmaker knows what the exchange price is at all times, why not just cut the odds rather than restricting the punter's taking openly available lines. Secondly, placing singles instead of multiples. A large-scale review of historical bets in a bookmaker's data set showed that the single biggest indicator that profiled a sharp customer over a recreational customer was the tendency to place singles over multiples. Thirdly, clicking the max bet button. The vast majority of bettors betting one side of a line have no need to go anywhere near that button 
that allows them to look at whatever the maximum liability happens to be. Either they will be staking comfortably below it, or if they are a genuine high-stakes punter, they will stumble across a maximum limit that isn't of any interest to them. As with point one, punters who are clicking the max bet button are usually arbitrage players. Fourth, opening an account punting the deposit on a tight line at low odds and then punting the free bet, the deposit bonus on a tight line at high odds. Whilst it's true that the equity of a bet whose stake is not returned increases as the magnitude of the odds increase, there is no way you should know that unless you are either a sharp or you've read the dummy's guide to match betting. Either way, if you do that, you're already from day one highlighting your account as something that needs to be kept an eye on. If you take a high number of free bets relative to the normal bets that are available from the bookmaker, the number five, you can expect to receive restrictions. Even if you do this accidentally, I once actually got a £1,000 free bet from BetStars, the PokerStars sports book, because my golfer was winning at some stage of the tournament and didn't win the tournament. And there was a concession on that gave me a free bet. I didn't even know it existed. I logged on one day, I had a £1,000 free bet. I used the bet. From memory, it didn't win. And then I found myself restricted immediately afterwards. I got an email through. I wasn't allowed to have free bets anymore. I didn't even know that the free bet was going to be coming my way. I was an innocent party caught in the crossfire. Caught in some outdated algorithm that thought that I was taking and targeting free bets. Number six, beating the closing line. The bookmaker will record the odds of each bet you take. They will record the closing line, and if your average bet is higher than the closing line, you may find yourself restricted. Number seven, being in net profit. William Hill shops have a rule that once you're over £10,000 in profit net, then your future business will be restricted. I mean, God forbid you get lucky on a lucky 15 early doors in your venture. Even if you can escape other forms of profiling, this is a difficult one to get round as a long-term net profitable player. Number eight, withdrawing. The act of withdrawing may trigger a review of your account. This may be less prevalent than it was years ago. However, withdrawing any amount can only increase the risk of a review of your bet history, which also ties in with number nine, asking customer service anything. One of the most frustrating components of dealing with customer service is that as experienced bettors, we only really get in touch with them when they have done something wrong. A bet may have been incorrectly settled as a loser, or we have been underpaid. However, just as in point eight, by bringing attention to our account, we only increase the review of a bet history. Number 10, being associated with a winner. Are you married to someone who has been restricted? Do you live in the same address as someone who has previously been restricted? Unfortunately, your chances of restriction are heightened through nothing other than association. So are any of these fair? Listen, if you even ask that question, then you're not in the correct mindset. Moaning over these practices will achieve nothing. Rather, it will distract us. Our efforts are much better served masking the fact that we know how to win. After all, let's do a thought experiment here. The vast majority of bettors are losers who remain undetected because why would you have to detect losers? Some winners do get detected. We want to be the winners who are undetected. What would happen if bookmakers didn't restrict? All of the money would go to these people on the right-hand side, the detected winners. All of the money from the left, the big yellow Venn diagram, would go to the blue Venn diagram, paid for by the losers, transferring their money to the winners. It's really not that difficult to be a winner in these days of information sharing, match betting, arbitrage systems that are out there. Without restrictions... The whole community, the net Venn diagram, would decimate and the industry would be destroyed beyond an economically viable ecosystem. Rather than worrying about the restrictions, we must accept them that they have to play a part in the ecosystem and we must work with them and distance ourselves from this right-hand blue circle, the detected winners. That's where we don't want to be. So that's our game. We've got to win. But we've got to win undetected and sit in the little red zone of undetection. So that's a little summary of restrictions, why they happen, what we do. Now let's look at restrictions through the eyes of three different platforms in the next three videos. That will be online soft bookmakers, betting shops and exchanges.